The last days of the Second World War were incredibly chaotic. To nearly every German soldier, it became clear the war had been lost, both in the Wehrmacht and even among some ideological diehard Waffen SS. Europe was filled with large groups of refugees, displaced persons, and bands of soldiers that either were looking for another front to fight at or tried to reach the Western Allied powers before the Soviets caught them. A very curious event happened during this chaotic time. In Tirol, Austria, a centuries-old castle housed prominent French political prisoners. When a fanatical SS division attempted to take the castle, a German Wehrmacht unit ended up fighting side by side with a United States Army unit to defend these prisoners. It was the only time during the entire war that the Germans and Americans fought side by side, and it is often described as the strangest battle of the entire war. This castle, Schloss Iter, was used as a prison for French people of interest such as former French presidents, ministers, and former commanders of the French army. These people had been seized from France following Germany's rapid conquest of the country nearly five years earlier, and were locked up as political prisoners as a sort of bargaining chip, if you will. Among these imprisoned were former prime ministers Edouard Daladier and Paul Reynaud. Now, the Iter castle wasn't a regular prison. The guest rooms of the castle had been converted to prison cells, but the prisoners were free to move around. Furthermore, they had a full staff consisting of Dacha prisoners, and there was ample food and water available. SS Totenkopf for band of soldiers guarded them. In early May, these men too realized the war was lost. Iter was a subunit of the Dachau concentration camp, and the fact the commandant of Dachau, Eduard Weiter, fled to Iter as the camp was liberated and then proceeded to take his own life, well, it was quite the big giveaway the war wasn't going too well for the Germans. Following this event, Itter's prisoner commander fled together with the guards, leaving the prisoners behind. Following their abandonment, the prisoners armed themselves. They were aware of hostile SS divisions in the vicinity, and they weren't too wrong about that. Close by, the 17th Waffen-SS Panzergrenadier Division was preparing itself to recapture the castle. Knowing the Allies were close by, the prisoners had already sent an arrested Yugoslavian communist resistance fighter that worked at the castle as a handyman to try and get the Americans to come to rescue them. When he didn't return, the group sent their cook to try and find the Allies to rescue them as well. Meanwhile, the handyman hadn't disappeared or anything. No, he managed to reach Innsbruck, where US troops were stationed. Innsbruck was over 14 hours of walking away, but roaming SS units occupied all nearby towns. Although the castle wasn't in their military jurisdiction, the US commander, Major John T. Kramers, assembled a small rescue troop to go with the handyman. As for the cook, he reached Burgo, a small Austrian town. The Austrian resistance ruled over it, and the cook was brought to its leader, Wehrmacht commander, Major Sepp Gangl. Gangl was a highly decorated Wehrmacht officer that had refused official orders to retreat into Germany. Together with his unit, they were somewhat renegades that now occupied the Austrian town and led its anti-Nazi resistance. They realized defeat was imminent and tried to protect the town's population against SS war crimes. Gangl commanded 20 odd men, not enough to protect the castle against a larger SS division. Now, realizing this, he decided to call in the help of the Allied powers, rapidly advancing in the area. He took a white flag and managed to contact and surrender to a nearby US tank commander, Jack C. Lee Jr., and explain the situation. Lee agreed to assemble a rescue party, but not before scouting around the castle together with Gangl. It was one of the most curious alliances that were forged during the entire war. A United States tank commander taking a Wehrmacht commander on a reconnaissance mission. Now, upon return, Commander Lee assembled his own rescue party. The next morning, together with 14 soldiers, Gangl, a tank and truck with 10 former Wehrmacht soldiers, they approached the castle. But obviously, while all this was going on, the situation at the castle wasn't dormant. As a matter of fact, and this is just one of the many twists in this weird story, the prisoners requested an SS Hauptsturmführer they befriended, Kurt Siegfried Schrader, to take charge of its defense. So when Gangl and Lee arrived with their troops, the situation must have been rather odd. So he had French politicians that were prisoners under command of an SS officer greeting US soldiers and a former Wehrmacht officer coming to their aid. Nevertheless, the defense force was small. They were vastly outnumbered. Even with the prisoners taking up arms, there would be no match for the black brigades of the elite SS division preparing the recapture. 
The U.S. tank was placed at the castle's entrance, and the men took up defensive positions. On the morning of the 5th of May, the SS assault was launched. Around 150 Waffen-SS soldiers chipped away at the castle's defenses. Gangon was shot by a sniper trying to get Oreno to safety. Lee's tank was destroyed, although everyone survived the blast that destroyed it, and the castle walls were heavily damaged. The battle went on for hours, and as the ammunition of the defending force was about to run out at 4 p.m. that day, the column of tanks under the command of Kramer, contacted by the Yugoslav handymen, arrived. Some SS soldiers fled, and approximately 100 were arrested and subsequently sent to prisoner of war camps. The French prisoners were brought to safety and arrived in France four days later. For his exploits, Lee was awarded the Distinguished Service Cross. Gangel was the only fatal casualty of the assault and was posthumously declared an Austrian national hero. And, well, two days after this strange battle, Germany signed its unconditional surrender, officially bringing the Second World War in Europe to an end. Now, although this was the only time Americans fought side by side with the Germans, by the end of the war it wasn't too rare for Wehrmacht soldiers to counter the Waffen-SS actively. One such example is the story of Wichard von Alvensleben, a Wehrmacht officer. When the commanders of various concentration camps realized the war was over during the final weeks of the war, many set up transports of valuable prominent prisoners to the Dachau concentration camp. In total, 139 prisoners were put on transport, including family members of Klaus von Stauffenberg, who led the failed attempt on Hitler's life in the 20 July plot, Dr. Jalmar Schacht, co-conspirator of the plot, and Sigismund Payne Best, the British SIS officer that was kidnapped during the Venlo incident preceding the invasion of the Netherlands. I've made a video about both events if you're interested. At any rate, the evacuation of prisoners was under the command of Obersturmführer Friedrich Bader and Edgar Stiller. Because the communication lines with Berlin had broken, they only received orders to evacuate the prisoners, unsure what to do with them next. They did receive the order to execute all prisoners, if they risked getting arrested by the Allied troops though. Waffen SS and Sicherheitsdienst soldiers guarded the transport of prisoners. In buses and trucks, the prisoners were transported, initially to Labour Camp Reichenau in Innsbruck, Austria. But this camp couldn't house the prisoners, so they were moved to Hotel Prager Wildsee, a municipality in South Tyrol, where they arrived on the 28th of April. This entire area saw fierce Nazi resistance against the rapidly advancing Allied forces. The Hotel Prager Wildsee was, to the surprise of the captors, occupied by Luftwaffe generals and their staff. The only option was to move prisoners to the little town of Niederhof, 12 kilometers north of the hotel. In the town, accommodation was prepared for the prisoners and the SS and SD men that went on a drinking binge. Later that night, one of the prisoners discovered a note in the wallets of a drunkenly passed out SD officer calling for the execution of all prisoners. In addition, the drunk guards started to behave more aggressively towards the group of prisoners. So the next day, one of them, Colonel Bogislav von Bonin, who was imprisoned after allowing a retreat from Warsaw following the Soviet Vistula Oder Offensive, asked a local Wehrmacht liaison office to get in touch with an old friend. He rang General Hans Rüttinger, who had his headquarters close by in Bolanzo. He identified the high-profile prisoners and communicated the incredibly dangerous situation the prisoners were in and the fear they were going to be executed. In response, Rüttinger's superior General Oberst Heinrich von Wittinghof decided to send a Wehrmacht unit to Niederhof to ensure safe supervision of the prisoners and make sure no laws were broken. Wehrmacht Captain Wichert von Alvensleben was tasked with the protection of the prisoners, and together with two men he was sent to Niederhof, where he ran into Friedrich Bader. Von Alvensleben said he was a representative from General Oberst Heinrich von Wittinghof, and that Bader's mission to transport the prisoners was completed. As a Wehrmacht captain, he had no authority to give orders to the SS, however, and indeed Bader refused to accept the order. In a precarious position and heavily outnumbered, von Alvensleben left the town and called for a Wehrmacht group to be dispatched to Niederhof. 45 minutes later, 15 Wehrmacht officers arrived, which still was not enough in case chaos would break out. As such, a large army unit was requested and 150 extra Wehrmacht soldiers arrived two hours later. The group then re-entered the town, positioned themselves in the town square, and von Alvensleben once again negotiated with Bader and Stiller about the release of the prisoners. A very tense situation developed where a firefight between the SS troops and Wehrmacht unit was a genuine possibility. 
Only after a near standoff and the realization among the captors they were heavily outgunned, they did concede. The prisoners were handed over to the Wehrmacht unit that was to protect them from now on, and Bader and Stiller's men retreated. They moved inland and the Wehrmacht moved the prisoners back to the Prager Wildse Hotel. There, they resided, with the Wehrmacht protecting them until the Allied forces finally rescued them four days later. The Wehrmacht soldiers, including von Albensleven, voluntarily surrendered, and the soldiers were released from US custody later that year. Both the story of Castle Itter and the standoff between the Wehrmacht and NSS in Niederhof are curious tales from those final days of the Second World War, where the line between ally and foe were very blurred, leading to very strange situations. Thank you for watching this video. If there's a topic or event you'd like to know more about, let me know your thoughts in a comment. I would also really like to thank all my patrons for their support. If you enjoy House of History and want to support my work, consider checking me out on Patreon. For just $1 a month, you will already gain access to the exclusive Patreon series. Don't forget to subscribe. See you next time.